Andrew Murray and his message, chapter 16, still bringing forth fruit in old age, full of sap. Psalms 92, verse 14, RV. 1905-1916, missionary enthusiast. Although Dr. Murray had retired from the work of the ministry as far as being responsible for a congregation is concerned, he by no means ceased his activities. Just after Mrs. Murray's death, it seemed to many that his working days were over. They did, but they forgot the mighty God who feeds the strength of every saint. On May 9, 1908, Dr. Murray's Diamond Jubilee was celebrated, and in view of the work that he was enabled to accomplish during the succeeding eight years, the sermon he preached on the following day, Sunday, was prophetic. He took for his text 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, Our gospel came unto you in power. His divisions were, 1. God's people need evidence of his power. Number 2. God's power is revealed in his word. Number 3. Faith is the means of receiving that power. Number four, full surrender to God, the condition of experience him. He commenced his sermon by saying, I am an old man. As I have grown old, I have prayed that God would let me show forth his power to the generation to come. God granted his request and satisfied his soul. For in the coming years, he was enabled to prove afresh that the God of Abraham still responds to the prayer of faith. And he who had no reserve of strength, and who was crippled by an injury to his back, through a fall from a cart, did work which would have tried, if not have, had not been beyond the power of many a young man. And he did that work with mighty energy, and moved multitudes of people to put forth effects, efforts in connection with the work of God, who had never before been so moved. A serious crisis in connection with the missionary work of the church called for a powerful leader, and God's agent servant responded to the call, and God responded to his call of faith. The story of the missionary work of the Dutch Reformed Church is full of interest. It has been already recorded in this story how in the old Graf Rennet home, Andrew Murray the Elder had trained his children to take an interest in the missionary movements of the churches in Scotland and England, and also on the continents of Europe. As a student, Andrew, the younger, had had his interest greatly stirred in this way while in Holland, and the impressions then made were never effaced. But among the people of his congregations, generally, in earlier years, there was little sense of responsibility towards the heathen by whom they were surrounded. This is not to be wondered at, for the first contact, the early Vortrekkers, pioneers, had with the natives, was in constant strife and in much bloodshed. It is easy for those who live in these peaceful times to blame unsparingly those hardy men who were laying the foundations of the civilization we now enjoy. But apart from the fact that these natives had been the slayers of friends and relatives of those who survived. It is the further fact that the true missionary spirit is the result of a quickened and vigorous life in the believer, and no one pretends that, as a rule, the Vortekers had spiritually minded men beyond the ordinary. Many of them truly feared God, and it was this fear that kept them from falling into open forgetfulness and neglect of the ordinances and the word of God. We may not measure them in our measures. They lived in another world, a different world from ours. But contact with the savages of heathendom did not so affect Andrew Murray, and in his free state days he was feeling the need of doing something for them. But his people were living in the pre-missionary age of the 17th century. In the chapter dealing with his pastorate at Worcester, mention was made of the fact that Mr. Murray accompanied the first missionaries sent by the church to begin work in the north of the Travel, Transvaal. But the years passed and little or nothing further was done. All that had been done, however, centered around Andrew Murray. And when his own children began to offer themselves for the work, a very important step forward had to be taken. Now, in a new sense, Andrew Murray became the father of the missionary work of the church. In 1881, the second daughter felt called to mission work. When Mr. Murray was in England, he made inquiries whether she should join the China Inland Mission, for there seemed then no opening connection with his own church, 
but he finally decided it was better she should remain in South Africa. This fact gave a new interest in missions to a large circle of relatives, and she was the first of a band of about 30 cousins, who later on entered the mission field. Dr. Murray, Miss Ferguson, and other friends in 1885 united in praying for 20 missionaries for home and foreign work during the following five years, and God graciously granted their request. In 1886, a minister's missionary union was started at the suggestion of a young minister, Reverend H.C. DeWitt. Dr. Murray immediately took it up, and others united themselves with him. They made contributions from their own allowances. Dr. Murray's contribution was 25 pounds per annum. When he retired on pension, he continued to pay this amount. Once on his 40 net, the secretary returned it, saying it was surely a mistake. It was too much, but it was sent back with a note stating there was no mistake. In this year, the first two ministers offered their services as missionaries. The one was sent to Nashonaland. The other, Reverend A.C. Murray, nephew of Dr. Murray, went to start a new work in N-Y-A-S-A-L-A-N-D in 1888. The newly formed Missionary Society consisted of 50 members and some well-wishers, and its income was 350 pounds per annum at this time, an average of 7 pounds per member per annum. In Nyasa land, there had been, during the first 10 years, considerable growth. The workers numbered 14 in 1899. Doors were opened on every side. In whatever direction the missionaries journeyed, they found the natives, eager to listen to the word. Reverend A.C. Murray wrote, You have been praying that God would open the door for his word. That is no longer necessary. There are so many open doors that we are thrown into a condition of great perplexity. Recognizing the importance of this crisis, the committee was summoned to meet at Dr. Murray's home, Clervex, where, after much prayer and conference, the following circular was drawn up. To friends and supporters of the Naya Sudland Mission. Dear friends, we are in special need of your assistance in prayer. The call for more workers is most insistent. The need for more money to continue the work makes itself continually felt. Moreover, there is greater need for the powerful working of the Spirit of God as congregations are being formed in the mission field. We therefore invite you all to set aside a portion of your day, though it were but half an hour, on Ascension Day, May 11, 1899, in order to seek the Lord's guidance, pray specially, number one, that the Lord, through His Holy Spirit, may graciously work in the hearts of His children, so that more laborers may offer themselves, and that His, his people may come forward willingly to support the work financially in the spirit of true self-denial. Number two, that the Lord may fill with His Holy Spirit all our missionaries, evangelists, teachers, and converts in spelled N-Y-A-S-A-L-A-N-D. Number three, that in the course of the next five years the workers may at least be doubled. If we pray sincerely, asking at the same time what God would have us to do, the blessing both for ourselves and Naya Savan will be sure in the name of the Committee of the Minister's Mission Union, Andrew Murray and others. The answer came quickly. During the next four years, although the angle bore war raged and left its aftermath of sorrow and commercial depression, 14 new workers were sent out. To quote the larger biography, gifts of money, frequently from unsuspected sources, and sometimes in comparatively large amounts, streamed into the treasury. The Nyasa mission has grown rapidly. In addition to it, the Free State and Transvaal have now each their own mission, the one in northern Rhodesia and the other in Portuguese East Africa. In 1899, Dr. Murray received an invitation to speak at the Ecumenical Missionary Conference to be held in New York in 1900. He did not, however, feel that he could leave South Africa then. But as the committee of this conference was so urgent in its wish for him to attend, and as he still could not see his way clear to go, he wrote, The key to the missionary problem, he says, I found in the report presented to this conference many important suggestions as to how interest in missions may be increased. But if I may venture to say it, the root evil, the real cause of so much lack of interest, and the way it should be met was hardly dealt with. The message of his book is, The Missionary Problem, 
is a personal one. Every believer ought to be a soul winner. Every minister holds office under the Great Commission. The missionary enterprise is the work not merely of all, but of each. Of this book, Dr. Horton says, I want the people to read it too, because it seems to me the most inspired and inspirating book written in 1901, the true note of the new century. Dr. McLaren says, I hope that Dr. Murray's heart-searching book may be widely read and preferably pondered. It is the key to the missionary problem, indeed, but it is also the key to most of our problems and points to the only cure of all our weaknesses. In a little pamphlet entitled, The Kingdom of God of South Africa, he makes this appeal. Prayer is the life of missions. Continual, believing prayer is the secret of vitality and fruitfulness in mission work. God has taught us in the history of missionary revival that it was in answer to half a century of prayer for the outpouring of His Spirit that the awakening came. God calls us now again to unite in fever and unceasing prayer for the power of His Spirit in the home churches. If our missionary enterprise is to be carried on under spiritual conditions of the highest force, brethren, let us pray in the spirit of faith and joy and love. Just at that time, Dr. Murray preached his sermon on the power of God, already mentioned. The prospering mission work of the church was faced by a serious financial deficit of 2,500 pounds. The committee issued a request for special prayer at Whitsuntide in regard to this matter, and Dr. Murray preached at Wellington on Exodus chapter 14, verse 15, and impressed the congregation with a sense of the seriousness of the crisis in the mission work. Miss Murray described it as a never-to-be-gotten sermon. The words were those God spoke to Moses in his hour of trial, speaking to the children of Israel that they go forward, e even if there is no way through the sea and the enemy is mighty and near at hand. Tell them to go forward. There is a time to pray and also a time to work, a time to exercise faith, to believe that the prayers that have been offered have been answered, and a time to arise and do what God commands us to do. Like a general with his army or an officer with his battalion, he sees that the moment has come for action. He inspires and speaks courageously. Forward, men, charge. So God calls you. God often speaks to his people. Forward, men, charge. In this battle against the host of hell and its forces against sin and the world, I have heard the voice of God call on his people to go forward with new vigor and new hope, to bring out new forces for the work of extension. I have heard his voice calling on his people to renew their vows, to redouble their efforts in advancing his kingdom upon earth. His voice is calling on every side. Three months ago, Dr. Jacob Chamberlain died in India at the age of 72. He was one of the most gifted preachers of the DR Church in America. In his last address, he said this, The time has come when the whole church must redouble her efforts and understand that the reason why the church exists is to go and preach the word to every creature. I still hear the cry of forward ringing in my ears. As a result of this appeal, Wellington Consistory made arrangements for the holding of the Congress to consider the matter, and out of this Congress came the establishment of a layman's missionary union, and money was pledged to cover the, the deficit, and together with 2,500 pounds for further extension and a provisional annual increase of 20%, 25%. Lastly, a missionary crusade was initiated, which proved a great blessing to the church and work. The missionary crusade was not only inaugurated by Dr. Murray, but the weight of the responsibility and the work of carrying out the scheme fell upon him as he entered his 80th year. He traveled through the country far and wide, speaking at many of the chief centers of population and giving rousing addresses on behalf of the mission cause. Old as he was, he found his experiences as a crusader most interesting. The people offered wondered how he, such an old man, could stand it. His daughter Mary once said, Father, you will die in that train. No, my child, he answered, I shall not. I shall die in my bed. And this also proved to be true. It was another opportunity of proving God's faithfulness, and when the crusade closed, 10,000 pounds had been raised for, mission, for missionary needs. The following account by his daughter of a small portion of his tour shows how full of vigor God's old servant was. She says, We arrived by train at uh, Kronstan at 2.30 a.m., where the carriage was disconnected from the train and stood in the station yard. 
At 6.30, the Dutch minister, Reverend M. V. D. Lingen, made, met us and took us to his house where we rested to breakfast at 8.30. 10 to 11 a.m., minister's meeting. 11.30 to noon, he visited all the old members of his Wellington congregation resident in Kunstan. After dinner, rested till the convention meeting at 4 p.m., which lasted till 5.30, and Dr. Murray gave the principal address. Evening meeting, 7.30 to 9.30, when he again gave the chief address, retired at 10 p.m., rose at 1.30 a.m. to catch the 2.30 a.m. train to Bonfontaine, where he arrived at 11 a.m., and after resting, Dr. Murray attended all the sessions of the Congress for the next two days and gave the chief addresses. It was wonderful how fresh all the addresses were. One of his brethren remarked, he never repeats himself, one secret of his power was that every message was newly received for the occasion. He did not offer stale bread to hungry souls. She adds further, during the next six years, he traveled much up and down the country, usually taking one long tour each year, lasting from three to five weeks, and then shorter journeys as opportunity offered. The winter tour almost always included the annual conference of the Christian Students Association, where he usually gave several addresses. He generally attended other conferences also, such as the Layman's Missionary Union. Often he was invited to take part in the services connected with the opening of new churches, and communion sessions seasons often gave him the opportunity for preaching two or three sermons. Going to Johannesburg for a Kinswick convention and a missionary congress and the ten days of prayer at Pentecost, he preached 28 times in 20 days, and it was preaching. From a full heart he would pour out praise and thanksgiving for traveling mercies and intercessions on behalf of the work and for the friends he had met as we drew near home after these tours. In his home he was just as energetic as when on tour. He usually dictated letters and books both in the morning and afternoon, but he was always ready to meet any friends who came to see him, and he would have prayer with them. Often friends came from Cape Town to stay for the day. He took much interest in the grandsons who lived with him. When not writing, he spent much time on the broad uh, veranda in front of his study. There he would sit and pray and meditate. Once asked what he was doing, he replied, I am asking God to show me the need of the church and to give a message to meet the need. Children remember to bask in the love of God as we bask in the sunshine. He would say on a winter's day when enjoying the sunshine on the, the veranda. One day on the convention, speakers came to him as he sat there surrounded by several friends. Well, my brother, he said, what news? He replied, I have brought you a pamphlet to read, which has deeply interested me. What is it? He asked. Oh, it is an exposure of the damaged spiritualist is doing, and its title is Satan Among the Saints. With a twinkle in his eyes, he took the book and said, But I want to hear of God among the saints. In 1911, political feeling ran very high, and it was affecting church life. It seemed to call for some special effect, some effort to counteract it. So early in 1912, the theological professors at Stellenbosch sent out invitations for a ministerial conference at which about 200 ministers, missionaries, and students were present in response to the call. It was a solemn time as they saw it in God's presence to search their hearts, and God dwelt with many. Dr. Murray was emphatic in his expression of the conviction that one chief cause of weakness was the lack of prayer, and his address on this subject, which were first published in Dutch, were later translated into English and published by Morgan and Scott under the title The Prayer Life. Before and after the Stalinbach Conference, his mind was engaged on the subject of prayer, and as a result, he wrote twelve little books of short meditations on the subject during the last five years of his life. A book written previously in Dutch was translated by his daughter under the title Thy Son Shall No More Go Down, and was distributed by hundreds in the Navy. Closely connected with the missionary movement were all the societies at work among the young to lead them to a full surrender of life and its powers to the Lord Jesus Christ, and these had his warmest support. Miss Bliss had been the means of establishing the Christian Endeavor Movement in Wellington. The first convention represented only seven societies. In 1897, a visit from the founder of the CE Movement, Reverend D. Clark, Reverend Dr. Clark, gave a fresh impetus to the work. Dr. Murray much enjoyed meeting such a kindred spirit and did all he could to make the visit a success. 
He became and remained president of the society to the end and took a deep interest in the work. Besides the English branch, there is now a large Dutch branch for about 5,000 members. To the society, Dr. Murray dedicated his book on The Mystery of the True Vine. Another society for young people which had a warm place in Dr. Murray's heart and prayers was the Students' Christian Association. Two small missionary volunteer student bands had been formed in connection with the Theological Seminary in Stottenbach and the Missionary Institute and in Wellington, respectively. Later on, these became united with the Students' Christian Association and formed the nucleus of the volunteer movement in which were enrolled those students who felt the call of God to devote themselves to mission work. Great was Dr. Murray's joy when his youngest son and two nephews, three student volunteers, left together for Naya Salem. In 1896, Mr. L. Wisthart and Reverend Donald Fraser, who was on his way to Naya Salem, was as a missionary, came to Cape Town in the interest of the SCA. They were warmly welcomed, and Dr. Murray threw all his influence into the movement they represented. He was almost always present at their annual conferences and usually gave several addresses of great power, and yet so simple that the youngest present could understand him easily. And he was so full of vigor in life and made the service of Christ seem so attractive that no speaker was more acceptable than he. One secret of his ever-abiding influence with the young was that he was intently interested in them and the students who came for a quiet talk in the study never went away without being the better for it. Once after revival services, he made peculiar inquiries for the student concerning two schoolboys who professed conversion. The student said, I do not know how they are spiritually, to which Mr. Murray replied, A nurse always knows the state of her patient, implying he was the spiritual nurse of these babies in Christ. One other fact has to be remembered. Writing about Dr. Murray after his death, one of the young members of the family said, Uncle, Uncle Andrew never grew old one who was for long closely associated with him, said he always remind, reminded him of a man described in the 92nd Psalms. Psalms 14 RV. He shall be green and full of sap. The charm of Andrew Murray was that in him so much of the character and life of his adorable Lord had been worked out, and young people and maidens felt, as well as older people, the power of an endless life in him. Once more, to God be all the glory. Andrew Murray and his message. Chapter 17. He fell asleep. Acts 7, verse 60. In sure and certain hope. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14. Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. Psalms 37, 37. The closing years of Dr. Murray's life were spent in the midst of sorrows and turmoil of the World War, and he, like so many others, was called upon to realize its bitterness by the loss of his fine, noble son, Halesden, who fell in southwest Africa in seeking to save a comrade. But in spite of all this turmoil and sorrow, his own spirit was entering into a deeper and sweeter peace in God as the days passed. One of the family writing at an early period, says, Father speaks very quietly now, with very little exertion, but with great spiritual power. It seems like a voice on the verge of eternity, of one, just ready to go on living with God's will, living while God wills. Glad to live to deliver God's messages, but he talks little and spares all his strength for work. Yet he was never more bright and joyous in his whole life, so restful and peaceful. The world and all its interests are in obediency. God's kingdom and its interests absorb his thoughts and heart. While this is a true testimony, both at the time it was written and later on as well, yet he never lost touch with the life that was around him. And one of his visitors during the war was filled with wonder at his, intellect, his intellectual interest in aeroplanes, and frequently he relieved his mind by reading some article in an encyclopedia or magazine, but his life was truly hid with Christ and God. He was deeply interested in the war news as it reached him day by day, and he learned many lessons from it. Here is one. That which is impossible with man is possible with God. How many impossible things have been made possible? We see that in the present war. 
who, some years ago, would have believed in the possibility of ships being able to carry crews of men for hours at a stretch, underwater, and to shoot underwater. Who would have believed in the possibility of fights in air ships? Yet today, they are realities. What has made these things possible is the patient, persistent, watching, and waiting on nature to reveal her laws, such as Edison and Macquarie have exercised in the faith that the secret would be wrestled from nature some time. Everything was surrendered to the one purpose of finding out the secrets of the law of nature. It is the same with God's laws. His workings are hidden and not generally understood, but to him who surrenders himself fully and completely to wait for God's revelation in the soul, the secret of what is possible with God will be revealed. There are possibilities of sanctification and the application of God's power in the soul that can only be proved by those who in faith wait in him to make possible what is impossible with man. A further illustration of his interest in current events may be given. Immediately after the outbreak of hostilities, a number of German professors and ministers of religion issued a manifesto justifying the German government in declaring war. A copy of this manifesto was sent to Mr. Murray, who prepared the following reply, which was never sent. But it is worth inserting here, for the re revelation it gives of a truly Catholic spirit, with no closing of the eyes to facts. To the brethren who sent from Berlin a letter to the evangelistical Christians abroad, Beloved brethren, I am in receipt of your letter of August and desire to send an answer, expressing my sense of the deep and divine unity which exi exists among God's children in the nations that are now at war. They know that they are the members of one body in Christ Jesus. In regards to the contents of your letter, there will be, of course, very great differences of opinion, but this is not the time or the occasion for entering upon them. It is our great duty as beloved in Jesus Christ to love each other through all the misunderstandings and estrangement that a war causes. You speak of the fellowship and cooperation inaugurated in the Edinburgh Conference, for which you and others have since that time been striving so earnestly. As far as that union was human, it will not be able to stand the strain of the war with all the bitterness that it rouses in human nature. But as far as it was a unity in the power of the Holy Spirit, uniting us closer in the persons of Jesus Christ. There is in it a divine life and energy to surmount every difficulty that endeavors to break it. And my one object in writing these lines is to send you my brotherly greetings in Christ Jesus. The members of the body of Jesus Christ, whether in Germany or England, are bound in the love of eternal spirit. For a time, national or personal differences may stir up unholy feelings, but the moment we return again into the secret of God's presence and hide ourselves under the shadow of his wings, we are brought back to the place where we are really one, and our love and prayer pours itself forth on behalf of all who are in Christ Jesus. Accept the assurance of my continual daily prayer that God may help me and you, dear brethren, and all who are apparently utterly separated from each other by the war, even to take refuge in the high priestly prayer of our beloved Savior, and in the power of His grace, to pray in the fullness of faith and love with our Lord Jesus, that they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in them, I in them, and Thou in me, that we may be one, even as we are one, that they may be made perfect in one. In this love, ever yours most faithfully, Andrew Murray. In June 1916, Dr. Murray preached in Wellington for the last time but none seemed to realize that it was the last. The following week, he, at the age of 88, together with his brother, age 70, made a six-day tour of Somerset West, Caledon, and B-I-L-L-I-E-R-S-D-O-R-P, holding five or six services at each place. It was a touching sight to see these veterans so full of zeal and life. On his return, he said to his daughter Annie, whoever acted as his amenuous, as a result of my visit to Caledon, I must begin a new book. I can't help it. He then dictated the titles of eight chapters and the whole of the first two chapters of the new book. For some years, Dr. Murray had been suffering from a hardening of the arteries, a common um, accompaniment of old age and the end was drawing near. In August, he had an attack 
of influenza from which, though he rallied, he never really recovered strength. God was gently taking down the pins of the earthly tabernacle. Miss Murray records straps of conversation at Patmos. Sitting on the veranda looking out over the sea, he said, Just look at the sea, what beautiful waves. How full the sea appears to be today. Just like the love of God, so boundless, so vast, so free, so full. Can we look upon this beauteous ocean and doubt the love of God? Does not each wave seem to say to us, Have faith in God? He is so wonderful, so mighty. He is the Almighty, Annie. Where is Annie? I want to write so that all may know that this wonderful, mighty God, so loving, so tender, so unutterably worthy to be trusted and believed in by perishing mortals who are so un unable to grasp his greatness and majesty and might. In December, they returned to Wellington, for his weakness increased. His mind often wandered, but during the night, when he could not sleep, he poured out his heart in prayer for ministers, for God's people, for the country. To one of his daughters on her birthday, he said, I give you as a birthday text, Psalms 20, especially the words, The Lord fulfill all thy petitions. For a birthday present, I will give something for your mission in Ananam, A-N-N-A-M. I have been thinking much about the Armenians and can give something for them too. On another occasion he said, Pray, pray, pray for the nation that it may be a righteous nation. What our people need is the spirit of self-sacrifice. There is a need of those who would be willing to give their lives for the nation to sacrifice themselves for the sake of education of the poor whites. His mind was still on the book he wanted to write. In a letter from a friend about the death of a little child, the word promotion was used. He said that word promotion has given me a thought for the new book. Promotion is the favor of God. So I will write how we may obtain it, very simply, so that the most ignorant can understand it. First, I will write about the favor of our great God. Second, we obtain it only through Christ. And lastly, it is applied by the Holy Spirit. On the day after Christmas Day, he thought it was New Year's Eve, and so wished to hold a meeting, asking them to sing um, Open Iwan Demont. He said, God loves to give, and we should open our hearts wide to receive him. We have now to close the book of the year. On one side, which is full, we have the record of the prayers offered, and the answers of help and grace supplied. On the other page is blank, and there are two columns. Above one is written, Prayers Not Offered. Above the other, grace is not received because not asked for. Oh, how much we have missed of blessing this year because we have not opened our mouth wide for God to fill. Let us seek in the new year to have our hearts opened and our prayers, our petitions made deep, to ask and receive more from God. Later on, he said, This great and wonderful God of ours wants to live out His own life in us. He can do so only as we dwell in love. We can dwell in love only as Christ lives out his life in us, when we are fully yielded to him. Let us then surrender ourselves to him, that more of God's great and wonderful life may be lived in us. On the last evening of his life, he paused as he was preparing for bed and said, We have such a great and glorious God. We ought to always, we ought to be always rejoicing in him. And then he prayed, O oh, ever blessed and glorious God, satisfy us with thy mercy, that we may, re may rejoice and be glad in thee all our days. Satisfy me that I may rejoice and be glad always in thee. Miss Murray writes, Early the next morning at 3.30, Sister Brown, who was nursing him, called us and said, I think your father is going. His pulse is so weak. So he got up and went into his room. After some time, he seemed to revive, and my sisters wrestled to rest while I remained watching at his bedside. That was my farewell to him. He was conscious at times and would say, Have faith in God, my child. Do not doubt him. He was so sure that God would hear prayer. Later on he said, Ah, it is my little Emily, my eldest child. He stroked my hair and then relapsed into unconsciousness. After a while he revived and said, God is worthy of trust. I was kneeling in an attitude of prayer when he said these things to me. He thought I was praying, but I was just committing him to God. I knelt there till five o'clock. Then I opened the shutters and said, Father, the day is just dawning, and it will soon be light. And I retired, leaving him to the care of the nurse. During the day he was restless, but passed away peacefully into the presence of the Lord, his Savior, and the Master, 
whom he had served so long and faithfully, at 6.45 on the 18th January, 1917, in the 89th year of his age, when Charles Wesley was nearing his death, an old man who dedicated words particularly fitting, not only his own case, but the experience of this aged servant of the one Lord. In age and feebleness extreme, who can a helpless soul redeem? Jesus, my only hope, thou art, strength of my failing flesh and heart. Oh, let me catch a smile of thee, and drop into eternity. Andrew Murray and his message, chapter 18. He being dead yet speaketh. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4. Uncle Andrew never grew old, was the statement made by one of his nephews. It was a very important sentence. Dr. Murray still lives, and will live in his writings. He will never be the chosen companion of those who want to follow Christ with as little trouble as possible, but to those who are willing, as he was, to forsake all and follow him, he will still be friend and helper. Probably more has been said and written about him since his death than during all his long life, and while there is no desire to glorify him, the short story of his life may well be brought to a close by bringing together a few outstanding testimonies concerning the man and his influence. First of all, however, we are privileged to have a glimpse of his prayer life. We know how uh, constantly he insisted on the prime importance of prayer and especially of intercession in the life of the believer. There was found after his death a small book in which he made notes from time to time in connection with his own prayer life. He entered in this book list of subjects for which he was specially making requests in prayer and the answer also are recorded as God, in his mercy, responded to his cry. In one of the earlier pages he wrote down as matters for special prayer, for a girls' school at Wellington, for godly teachers, for the children of godly parents, for the power of the Spirit in all my work, that it may, that it be not done in my own strength. Those who know Wellington see in the noble pile of buildings now standing there in connection with the Hunot Seminary, the outward proofs of answered prayer. They know that in Miss Ferguson and Miss Bliss and a succession of godly women who followed them and worked with them there was a further answer to prayer. And they recognize in the long-continued line of students who have gone out to bless the land a further reason for glorifying God for his mercy. How God answered his servant's prayer for his own work his whole afterlife testifies. In another entry he writes, I need and desire to pray. I am praying for these blessings. Number one, that I may endeavor in preaching to make clear this truth of made importancy. Conversion is surrender of sin of all sin. Number two, for wisdom in dealing with young converts. Number three, how to act in dealing with the impenitent. Must I go to them to speak? Father, I am thine, to do thy will alone. Thou wilt guide me. And again, in the midst of building operations, may I have grace to do everything by faith and prayer, and to have everything done so as to cultivate the spirit of love with those with whom I work. And let me, myself, feel that when once I have cast my cares upon him, they are his concerns and not mine, and that he will do all for me, May I have grace with stones and bricks and wood, that all the burdens and workmen to trust and pray and rest in his faithfulness who never fails. Unspeakable privilege to cast all my cares upon him, I can do so unceasingly. At moments it is as if they are too many, but with him it is nothing to make provision for all my wants. I feel it good to lay them continually before him and to pray for it. The architect's plan for the school, money, contractors, boys' school, men for our mission, our old school building, the, the Parel, that's P-A-A-R-L, infinite God, make me empty, and fill me full of thy Holy Spirit in love, full to overflowing, that when this weary world may see and drink, full of thy love to me, full of thy love to thee, full of love to them, full myself of love of loving kindness to everyone. Answer me, Lord, why should any perish with such love, such infinite longing to bless them? How blessed it is to walk by faith in the dark. How right hand 
his right hand holding us and leading us. Blessed to know one whom we can trust to the utmost, and one who knows and sees from the beginning, who has foreordained our work for each of us, who has made the pattern in the mount for every part of his holy tabernacle. God, keep me praising, working, trusting, praying, waiting. This morning, thought much on what is God's will as regards asking people for money in the same way as I did for the girls' school, or has he not still a better way in store? Reading George Mueller. Miss McGill laughed today. Let the kindness that sent her here to our school be praised and trusted. May I ask that he should so provide that the school suffer no loss. I have no cares, O oh blessed will, for all my cares are thine. It is not interesting and encouraging, is it not interesting and encouraging to get a glimpse of this devoted and experienced servant of God in the midst of all his various occupations, making each new trial a new opportunity of trust and confidence? The work of intercession and the life of faith did not come to him any more easily than to those who would follow him as he followed Christ. But the result is worth more than all its cost. There lies at hand a volume full of cuttings of great interest, taken from religious and secular papers, and writing which show how greatly he was honored and esteemed by men of good will all over the world. From this storehouse there is a, is a room, is room but for but a few, and they are given because it is a peculiar way the writers were connected with Dr. Murray. The first is from the pen of Miss Ferguson, D period, LIT period, president, emeritus of the Hunat College for Girls, the first and the only collection for women in South Africa. The intention was that only women should attend the lectures or graduate from it. But exception is made in the case of men's students docile in Wellington. It was due to her and her lifelong companion and friend, Miss Biss, that the ideas of Mary Lyon were so successfully transplanted to and took such deep root in South Africa, so that even in these days of multiplied educational advantages, the Huna Seminary and College hold a unique place. What she has to say about Dr. Murray cannot but be of interest to a very large circle of readers. She writes, she calls it an appreciation. Dr. Andrew Murray, May 9, 1828, January 18, 1917. It was these two dates beneath the portrait of Dr. Andrew Murray in the morning paper, January 19th, that told us that an honored friend had entered into the presence of the king. What a wonderful entering in it must have been. The joy of it filled our souls as we traveled out to Wellington. As we looked for the last time at his saintly face, as we saw him laid, laid away in his last resting place, he was with the Lord whom he had loved with all his soul, whom he had served so faithfully, whom he had made a living reality in thousands of lives all around the world. What a welcome he had had. What would it mean to him to be emancipated with the, from the frailties of the body and pass forth his whole being in praise and adoration? He had done this very wonderfully on earth, and we who had followed him had in some measure entered into the rapture of the divine. But what would it be to him, with unveiled face, to come into the presence of the king, to be like him, because he sees him as he is? Surely our dear friend, being dead, will yet speak to us. We will read his books with new meaning, for he has entered into the secret of things, that he tried to make realities in our lives. And Andrew Murray, being dead, will yet live and bear much fruit. It has been a great privilege to Dr. Anna Bliss and myself to be closely associated with Dr. Murray for over 43 years. It will be 44 years in April since we saw his letters that brought us to Africa. Dr. and Mrs. Murray had read together a few months before The Life of Mary Lyon and the story of her pioneer work for the higher Christian education for girls in America. As they read, they said, this is what we want for our girls in South Africa. They had lost a short time before a little girl of five and a baby boy. And as Mrs. Murray said, their hands were empty for their new work for the master. With Dr. Murray, a vision of possibilities became action. 
he wrote to Miss Ward, the principal of Mount Holyoke Seminary, asking for one of their graduates to come to South Africa to establish a Mary Lyon school here. He wrote to others who might be interested. A few weeks later, he sent his private check for the passage money of the teacher. A friend in America, when told of this, exclaimed, What faith, what wonderful faith to send the money before he knows whether a teacher will come. There were frequent little meetings in Dr. Murray's study to commit the whole matter to the Lord. He wrote a short sketch of Mary Lyon's life for the Kirkbaum and sent with it a request for prayer that God would choose the teacher and incline her to come. It was about this time that, Mary, that Miss Bliss and I saw Dr. Murray's letters and were made willing to come, constrained, as we believe, by the prayers of God's children in South Africa. Dr. Murray had asked for one teacher, but those to whom he had written in America felt that one should not go alone. It was a work for two. They wrote to Dr. Murray in this effect. His answer was, I asked the Lord for one, he has given me two. It is like him to give me double what I asked for. And with this answer, he sent the passage money for the second teacher. Dr. Murray took, took his people at Wellington into his confidence, told them all the desires of his heart, and the answer that had come, and never did a people respond more heartily. He sent out a call to the girls of South Africa, telling them his desire that they might have a training that would fit them for the master's service. And they came, forty of them, that first term. And now we look back over forty-three years that it has been our great privilege to be co-workers with this man of God, entering into his plans, helping him to obtain his ideal in one department of Christian work that God had laid upon his heart. There were many consultations over the detail of the work, and all was brought in prayer to the Master and laid at his feet with the earnest desire that in all things we might know his will. He was very eager that our girls should be trained as teachers and be prepared when they were able to take up this work, and when the teacher's class developed into a teacher's training college under Mr. Hardy's efficient leadership, there was special gratuity. Gratitude. The Hunan College he looked upon as the natural outgrowth of the Hunan Seminary. The child must grow up. Our daughters must be fully equipped for the, possible, for the positions of responsibility they were to occupy. Because the work was for the Lord, he must give him the best possible for the development of life and character. The highest efficiency was to be able to pass on to others the good gifts received, to help others to their best body, soul, and spirit. Living in such close fellowship, we were interested in the many Christian activities that occupied Dr. Murray. He was keen to help the boys as well as the girls. The Missionary Training Institute, with its bands of young men going out into missionary work, was a great joy to him. The whole wide field of missionary work appealed to him. How South Africa might reach out the helping hand to the regions beyond was his constant study. He was ever ready to turn aside from the wider fields of our little corner and show how we might help. It is through his books that he has reached tens of thousands, and testimony has constantly come from one and another as to the transformation wrought in their lives through his message. His little pocket series of books on the secret of intercession, of adoration, of the faith life, etc., are full of fire and inspiration, and we who love his message will keep them by us and let him speak to us through them. He loved to gather God's people about him in conventions and wait with them before God for his deeper training, teaching, and for him to reveal himself in answer to prayer. He has shown me, as no other person has ever done, what it is possible for God to do in and through a life wholly yielded to him, where God is given right of way. A. C. Ferguson This may well be followed by an extract from an article written by the Rev. Henry Vickers Taylor, M.A., for the British Weekly, describing Dr. Murray as he appeared to him. Mr. Taylor was at the time minister of the Presbyterian Church, at Wellington, and although he represented a different school of thought from that of Dr. Murray, he recognized the unique place Dr. Murray filled in the religious life of the age. Many who knew the old saint intimately would not have expressed themselves as Mr. Taylor has done about his or oratory, 
or for they would feel that the overpowering weight of his words at times was too chiefly, if not wholly, to the power of the Holy Spirit within him. They, like Dr. Murray himself, believed that it was the power of the Spirit alone which made any preaching effective, and Andrew Murray dreaded the use of other power in the preaching of the Word. But Mr. Taylor's graphic description of this servant of God is full of interest, Mr. Taylor says. He seems wrapped about with a mantle of adoration. When preaching or conducting a service, his whole being is thrown into the task, and he glows with a fervency of spirit which it seems impossible for human flesh to sustain. At times he startles and overwhelms his listeners. Earnestness and power of the electric sort steam from him, and the fact alike the large audience or the quiet circle gathered around him. In his slight spent frame of middle height, he carries in repose a volcanic energy which, when he is aroused, bursts in its barriers and sweeps all before it. Then his form quivers and dilates. The lips tremble. The features work. The eyes spagmatically open and close. As from the white hot furnace of his spirit, he pours the molten torrent of his unstudied eloquence. The thin face and the immaculate body are transfigured and illuminated. The, the staid, venerable minister of the 19th century, with the sober clerical garb and stiff white tie, which is de la rigueur among the Dutch clergy, disappears, and an old Hebrew prophet stands before us, another Isaiah with his glowing imagery, a second Hosea with his plaintive yearning appeals. Audiences bend before the sweeping rain of his words, like willows before a gale. The heart within the hearer is bowed, and the intellect awed. Andrew Murray's oratory is of that kind to which men willingly go into captivity. Dr. Wilbur W. White of the Biblical Seminary, New York, tells in The, Criti in the Christian on May 1, 1924, how he was influenced by Andrew Murray's book, In the School of Prayer. My life was revolutionized by Andrew Murray's In the School of Prayer. As far as I can discern without this prophet's message, there never would have been release from the routine order of things to which I was then committed. It was in this wise, while professor of Hebrew and Old Testament literature in Annex Theological Seminary, the secretary of the YMCA asked me in January 1893 to lead a series of meetings in prayer. About a year before, my brother Campbell White had recommended Murray's book to me. Examination must have been superficial, for I found nothing particularly striking in it. Perhaps I was not then properly tuned, in, tuned up to listen in. The book being, in to, book being to hand and suggested by the secretary, it was selected as the basis of study for the meetings, which were duly announced. A week's program was printed. The meetings began on the following Monday. We took a chapter of Murray each day. Almost every sentence challenged me and sent me to the Bible. Herein was Murray's great contribution. He challenged me to study the teaching of the Bible about prayer. On the third day, I was led in the meeting to say, If Murray's teaching is true, there is more in the Christian life for me than I have ever experienced, and I am going to get more out of it or know the reason why. I soon learned the reason why. Those meetings from the very opening of the series were unusual. Before the end of the first week, it was clear that we should continue. Thus we proceeded for five consecutive weeks. Our marketed revival resulted in the community. In the midst of those weeks, there came a personal revelation of the love of God, which I cannot describe. It surprised and astonished me. It quieted and rested me. I shall never forget it. As I now interpreted it, it was my Pentecost. I have been different since. I do not know how to make plain the difference. Perhaps, for one thing, I was healed too exclusively before for high... Perhaps, for one thing, I was headed too exclusively before for high intellectual attainments. Since then, I believe, I have been more clearly and distinctly ambitious for the least possible thinking in everything. But there has been a blending of the intellect with the spiritual and the practical. In other words, a balancing of parts, which has made things distinctly different. One of the most striking reminiscences comes from the pen of one well-known in South Africa, Dr. F. C. 
Colby, now a Roman Catholic priest, occupying an important and prominent place in the ecclesiastic circle in which he now moves. He is well known also in literary and social life in Cape Town. There is a romantic story told in connection with his turning from the Protestantism in which he had been brought up and entering the Roman Catholic priesthood, but the fact remains that such a change has, change has taken place. He was at one time an, an inmate in Dr. Murray's house and family. The article from which these extracts are made was contributed by him to the Cape soon after Dr. Murray's death. He writes, the name of Andrew Murray's is graven with an iron pin in lead on the rock of South African history, and there it will stand forever. But it is also written in softer characters on the hearts of many, and in that gentler form of survival it will endure far beyond the ordinary lot of human names. I have known only one unkind word ever said of him, and that was, strange to say, in the synod of his own church. He had written a piece of advice, never mind what, it was his, and it was wise. And one member, not liking it, said that Mr. Murray was growing old. Old, of course he was, but with an age more full of honor than of years, and more full of wisdom than of honor. Do when Dr. Murray was in Cape Town, he had the characteristic and kindly thought of always having in his house, as guest, as a son indeed, some young man studying for the ministry. At that time, I was destined for the theological seminary at Stauffenbach's. So when Mr. Bozeman, now Reverend Dr. Bozeman of Pretoria, left, this inevitable privilege was offered to me. That was the time I saw Dr. Murray at the cl closest possible quarters. I may have been shy, but I certainly was observant. He was a very highly strung man. His preaching was so enthusiastic. His, his gestures so unrestrained that he was wearing himself out, and the doctor ordered him to sit while preaching. Now, such an output of nervous energy might well mean some reaction at home, some irritation with his wife, some um, uneasiness towards his children, some, some caprice with a stranger within his gates. <coughs> but no, I never knew him thrown off his balance. He was a solid gold throughout. When I came back from Europe, of course, he did not like my change to Catholicism. But I went to him, and we both spoke frankly. There was no quarrel. There was no bitterness in Andrew Murray. His nature was sweet to the core. There can be no sorrow over his departure. There was no mid-autumn spoiling of the crop, but the whole mature harvest fully gathered in, without shortcoming and without loss. And what a harvest. The following letter was written by a friend to the family giving some intimate recollection of Dr. Murray. It was addressed to Miss Mary Murray. The writer says, My dear Mary, I am very grateful to you for writing me something of the last days of your dear father. Such a feeling of loneliness came over me when I heard of his death. You know, he used to pray for us and for our work here every day. And my first thought was, what a loss to us and the congregation. You asked me to write down what I remember of your father's life. He was such a full and blessed life. His books, more than anything else, will testify to that. I remember his telling me one day that some people thought there was two little personal testimonies in his books. And I said to him, Oh, Mr. Murray, I hope you will not listen to them. I think the great power in your books consists of just that there is so little of yourself in it. And Christ is always in the foreground. Do you remember the time when he was not allowed to preach? A great change came into his life after that. He used to be rather stern and very decided in his judgment of things. After that year, he was all love. His great humility also struck me very forcibly at that time. I remember his coming home one day from a walk with his face beaming. He had conversed with an old colored woman on the road and had learned so much of God's love from her. His faith in God was marvelous and I learned many a lesson from him. I remember once going on a difficult journey alone with seven little children. When I went to bid him goodbye, he prayed so earnestly for me, and when he was finished, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, Now, my child, be perfectly still, and know that God has taken everything in, in his hands. I did it, and the way God undertook for me was marvelous. His power for work was something unusual. One day, your mother said to him, I think we ought to go home now. We are getting old. 
He replied, Speak for yourself only, mother. I don't want to die. There is much to be done still. I was often astonished at the amount of work he got through, even when traveling or having special services. He had a wonderful memory for faces, and also for things that happened long ago. I was often surprised to hear him tell of what happened fifty years ago when he was preaching in Zopt Spensburg or uh, Leidenburg. The old people in the Transvaal used to tell the most wonderful tales about him, his power of endurance, his great earnestness in preaching, and how frightened people often were of him, though he looked a mere boy. I often look back to the days he spent with us. It was a benediction to have him in the house. What made a great impression upon me at such times was the perfectly natural way in which he would take everything to the Lord in prayer. One day there was an argument with another man who was helping with special services here. This man was rather bent in heaven his own way. We ate dinner, and all at once Mr. Murray said, Let us ask God. We all knelt down at the table while he prayed. It seemed to me that the man looked rather ashamed of himself when we got up. At least he did not continue the argument. This was surely an unusual and eventful, very effective way of dealing with an overbearing brother. Dr. Murray had wonderful tenderness and skill in t dealing with such persons, and his patience seemed never to fail. The following article, which the writer calls An Impression, was written by one most closely acquainted with Dr. Murray, was while a girl at school and training college in Wellington, who later on went to the mission field. Sometimes one can know people for years and yet not really know them. That was my experience in regard to Dr. Andrew Murray. For years as a schoolgirl and teacher at Wellington, I looked at him but never really saw him, just like Thomas, who for years associated with Christ. And then a moment of revelation came, and it was the declaration, My Lord and my God. Well, my hour of revelation came one Pentecost Sunday at Wellington, 7th of June, 1908. There was a deficient, an alarming deficient, in the funds of the DRC mission. Missionary leaders in the church had been deliberately, had been deliberating what to do in regard to retrenchment. And at the same time, a crisis had arisen in the field, which demanded immediate extension. The Macedonian cry was, extension, more money, more missionaries. At the home base, people were considering whether there would be a forward or a backward movement. The decision came on Easter Sunday. Dr. Murray, frail in body, but magnificent in command and spirit, gave his marching orders. Exodus chapter 14, verse 15. The Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. He spoke as, having, as one having authority, as though the command had come straight to him for the church, from God Almighty himself. The one word, forward, was like a clarion call. There was a note of triumph, as though he was assured of victory. I felt Dr. Murray had faced the whole question not only materially, but spiritually as well. He had battled his way through the doubts and questions of man, through the onslaughts of the power of darkness right into the presence of God. He had prevailed with God and was now prevailing with men. It was truly like a general marshalling his forces, urging them on to victory, sure of the ultimate issue. This was the hour of my revelation, when I beheld not Dr. Andrew Murray, but the Almighty God in and through Dr. Andrew Murray. As a result of the Pentecost message, a Congress was held at Wellington in August of the same year. Inspired by such a leader, there was boundless enthusiasm, and truly, his people were made willing in the day of his power. The layman's missionary movement in South Africa was started. Daring resolutions were passed, such as wiping out the disgraceful deficient before the end of the year, finding money amounting to some thousands of pounds for the forward movement of the mission enterprises of the church, securing the needed missionaries for extension purposes, trusting in him, who is more than able to supply all this. These resolutions became realizations before December of that year. The intervening months between the Congress and that time were spent in a missionary crusade throughout the land. Many startling and interesting stories can be told of this crusade. It was then for the first time that people were allowed to give generously in our country and church. Instead of the usual silver missionary collections, golden offerings were demanded and given, individuals giving lump sums amounting to 50 pounds or more. Sometime after this, I was at Woodstock Hospital preparing as a candidate for the SUM. Dr. Coral Klum 
was in town. A big meeting was held at the Wesleyan Met Metropolitan Church. People who in the ordinary course of events do not go to religious meetings and did not know Dr. Andy Murray went to this meeting to see and hear the traveler, Dr. Carl Kahn. Dr. Murray was there too, in his humble way, to welcome the man of the hour. A lady was sitting close to me, and as Dr. Murray went up the pulpit steps, frail and gray and old, she asked, Who is that old man? What a shame to make him go up those steps to preach. I smiled inwardly and thought, My dear lady, you will be surprised tonight. Dr. Murray got up. He seemed to grow tall and majestic. In regard to the new work in the sedan, he once more spoke according to the oracles of God. Forward was his cry. Well, my lady was surprised, and more than surprised, pity was made for reverency. What a voice for such a body, she exclaimed. Clear as a bell, irresistible in its power and command, the all-victorious forward rang forth in tones which knew no hesitation or defeat. And like Mary, who, through the one word, Mary, that resurrection morn knew and worshipped the Lord, so through that one word, forward, Dr. Andy Murray was revealed to me and I bowed and worshipped the Lord he served in love. And now the writer's task is finished. The compiling of the facts recorded in these pages has been a means of greatly quickening and strengthening to his own spiritual life, and his prayer has been and is that the reading of the record may be blessed to many. Andrew Murray is not a writer to be read through quickly. A little at a time is all that is possible for most students. One night at Clairvette's, the old doctor was going to bed. He had under his arm a copy of his book on the state of the church. And drawing it out, he said, Many a minister or other friend has said to me, I have read your book on the state of the church. Yes, they have read it through, and then put it on their, their study shelves, among other books they have read through. Now I have written that book, and yet I have to read it, and reread it myself so that I may be able to take in the true state of the church and be suitably moved by it. Most of the books, most of this book is Andrew Murray himself speaking, and after perhaps it has been read through to give the connected story of this life so full of God and so full of miracles, it would be well to go through it again and yet again, so as to benefit by the important message he has left behind him for last experienced travelers along the way to Zion. It will be helpful to read and think and pray over it till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the God of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4, verse 13. Andrew Murray, his message. Chapter 19. Andrew Murray's prayer life. The following extracts have been taken from a private notebook of Dr. Andrew Murray which became available for the writer only after the life had been written. Here a glimpse is given of the inner prayer life of this devoted servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is all in his own handwriting. On the opening page he writes, God's words are a seed which he sows in our hearts. This seed becomes fruitful in the words which we speak to God. Our words, our prayers, our seed, which we sow in God's heart. God watches over his word to see if it matures and fructates, and we must watch over and take notice if our prayers, which we have sowed, bear fruit. The believer must not forget what he has prayed for, so that he may be able to notice God's answers. This, then, is my account book with notes of the desire which he has awakened and of the reward that may be expected. Number one, a minister's prayer. Give thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people. First Kings chapter 3, verse 9. What a power lay hidden for thousands of years in water, the power of steam. What an influence it exerts today. So there lie hidden in the church of Christ powers that are not used. The Spirit of God can teach us to make use of some of them. But he must first give us some conception of the present unsatisfactory state of the church. He must give us an insight into what is possible with, with him, the Almighty One. Above all, he must show us what is the calling of the church, and then he can, by his Spirit, teach us how to reach 
a higher state. The Lord can cause such light to shine upon these things, His light, that we may see them and obtain them. Give the servant an understanding heart to judge the people. Thy servant for thy work among thy people. An understanding heart. Not understanding without the heart, but heart understanding. Give thy divine and effectuous gift. Number two. Evidently written on the eve of a holiday, a minister's holiday. Behold, I send an angel before thee to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Exodus 23, verse 20. A place of rest chosen by the Lord for his people. May the place of rest be a place of prayer. Rest, which is the result of true prayer. Prayer for which rest gives the opportunity. Lord, let the time of rest be a time of prayer. Prayer for the work that lies at hand. But above all, for the effective re re revelation of the great gift of the Spirit. Number three. Meditation on John chapter 6, verse 37 through 40. The minister and God's will. The work of Jesus has its value not only in what he did, but in the spirit in which it was done. He did all as the will of the Father. He would not be simply a Savior, but desire to fulfill the will of God for our salvation. The divine will in the Father is the foundation of our salvation, carried out by the Son and imparted to the believer, by the which will we are sanctified. By the which will we are sanctified. Hebrews 10.10 10. As I meditate on the will of God, sometimes it seems to me as if I shall be hindered and circumscribed in my work if I devote myself with fever and strength to prayer, that I shall be drawn off from my work if not hindered by the thought of what God perhaps wills. This is folly. The Son of God found his comfort and power in the will of the Father. It must be so also with me, the surrender of myself to the will of eternal love, so that through me he may fulfill his counsel in my safety and the assurance that my work will not be in vain. I shall in fellowship with him be a channel through which his fullness of love can flow out. Oh, that I may preserve in my inner being the spirit of intercession, love, singleness of heart, trust. May I trust him who can keep me. Eternal God, thy will rules everywhere. Inanimate creation serves thy will. It is its beauty. Angels ac accomplish thy will. It is their glory. Thy Son on earth did only thy will. I also, O oh my God, wish to accomplish thy will. To this end I desire to yield myself to thee. I do it now. Here am I, Lord. O oh, use me to further thy divine purpose. Thou doest accept of me, Lord, I believe. Give me the assurance. I rejoice in the will of God, which is love, and infinite power and always obtains its end. He will accept of me as his workman and servant. I accept thy divine power, so that thy will may be done in me and by me. Number four, meditation on Colossians 1, verses 9 through 10, and Colossians 4, chapter, uh, verse 12, the will of God. The difference between a life of self-reproach and a life of peace seems to consist in this. In the first, the believer intends to do the will of God in all things. It is for him an unbroken chain of difficult duties, of heavy burdens which must be carried, and in each case he has a conflict to wage and defeat to surrender. In the case of the other, he accepts the will of God as the power by which the divine life, as it, is, it was revealed in Jesus, may be obtained. He understands that he must just surrender himself to God's will, and God will bring it to pass in him. The Lord Jesus, as surety for his people, accomplished that will in the sacrifice of himself when he said, Not my will, but thine be done. There are for the believer four steps in the will of God. Number one. Surrendering God's, suffering God's will. Number one, suffering God's will. Number two, doing God's will. Number three, the knowledge of God's will. Colossians 1, verse 9 and 10. Number four, perfect in the will of God. 
Colossians 4.12. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Psalms 51.12. This is the will of God, even your sanctification. 1 Thessalonians 4.3. The will. It is not just the life, but the power of God, the Almighty will. And so I must surrender myself in the sure confidence that he will see that his will is accomplished. The eternal will is my sanctification. This will is conditional, and for its fulfillment is dependent on my free cooperation, my free consent. And now I have learned to trust. How blessedly can I now say, God wills my sanctification.